GTA one will be about another minute, and then the uh, Mind Pump show, uh, basically discussing all about bodybuilding movements for athletic performance. What's up, everybody? Why do athletes need bodybuilding exercises? A classic question where everybody always comes back to. Do we really, really need to train like bodybuilders? Is it functional to train like bodybuilders? Is this an area that is actually going to help us be beneficial? Uh, is this going to help us be more explosive? And I think like one of the simplest instructions I ever had around bodybuilding was um, talking about, man, it sounds like they're trying to break down the outside office door right now as they're throwing med balls into my wall. Um the high school throwers are just hammering the med ball. But when the easiest way to think about this, okay, is I think her name was Michelle Smith, if I remember correctly. She was an Irish swimmer, and I want to say it was like the 96 Olympics, 92, 96, maybe 2000. Uh, she was an absolute, like, just blew up, popped onto the, uh, you know, she was already on the international scene in swimming, but just absolutely killed it and jason if you could comment i think her name was michelle smith she's a swimmer uh from ireland that ended up winning like out of nowhere winning a couple gold medals and then she tested positive um and during that time frame uh a lot of people talked about her physique they they, they talked about how impressive she was they talked about uh just the fact that she had so much muscle and i think that you know going through that and looking at that right uh it it says something and then you know going into i want to say 2007 2008 um going into charles poliquin's gym getting his certifications and stuff spending time there he had mentioned like look people okay if if you look at and he used swimming as an example if you look at male swimmers versus female swimmers why do male swimmers swim faster? They have more muscle mass. Okay, they have more fast twitch muscle. Uh, so therefore, they are all. Her name was Michelle Smith. Okay, yes, Mich Michelle Smith. Um, I'm so happy I remembered her name. But then, you know, he talks about okay. So these, this woman was a swimmer with more muscle mass. She broke world records, wins all these medals, tests positive. But the fact that she had more muscle mass enabled her to put out more power. Now, why do women or why do men sprint faster? You know, we are taller, but also we do have more muscle mass. Men have more muscle mass. And so this plays a big role. Now, how am I linking this to why do athletes need bodybuilding exercises? There's a couple different factors here. I think first, if we can just look at, you know, what are bodybuilding exercises? And I like to think of bodybuilding exercises as easy movements that can isolate joints. Okay. So they can isolate a, a joint or a problem area. So you look at a, an, an athlete who, um, maybe they have elbow issues or wrist issues or ankle issues or lower back problems. You can isolate that specific joint and you can do a large amount of reps, very, very high reps, very high reps. Okay. Over and over and over and over again. So, those bodybuilding exercises can be used to target specific areas, but they can also um, potentially uh, bring more blood flow into specific areas to then in turn uh, lead to more, theoretically, more growth. And so that's, if we look at a perfect bodybuilding exercise as the Scott curl or the preacher curl, and then we look at incline curls, and then we look at hammer curls, and then we look at concentration curls, and then we're looking at spider curls. Uh, you know, now the list just goes on. Those are all going to be bicep related. Okay. If we're looking at triceps, right, we're looking at miracle grows, we're going to tell extensions, rolling triceps, uh, seated dumbbell, tricep extension, tricep, push down, lean away, tricep extensions. Those are, those are bodybuilding exercises for the triceps. Okay. If we're looking at the lats and I'm thinking now about Michelle Smith and our swimmer situation, right? We're, we're, we're going, okay, we can do pull-ups. We can do rope climb. Uh, we can do, 
um, neutral grip pull-ups. We can do curl-ups or chin-ups. And those are movements that could have a transfer to the performance world, but they also could be considered bodybuilding exercises. But then we look at, all right, what if we're doing really high rep one-arm row? What, what if we're doing really high rep bent-over row? What if we're doing really high rep chest rows? What if we're doing seated rows? That's a classic bodybuilding lat exercise. What if we're doing, you know, we're here, boom, here, Boom. What if we're doing really high rep lat pull down? Or if you watched our video with Ian Ross, the canoeer, one arm lat pull down. Now you're starting to see, okay, this is an isolation uh, movement that we can use to really target this area. We can do really, really high reps. And in turn, over time, over a long period of time, we're going to target that area and ideally build more muscle mass. Okay. So if we want to potentially look at then, okay, how do we how do we build more muscle mass from bodybuilding exercises? We know, I, I believe there's three to four means of building muscle mass. First, mechanical tension. Your body is aware that there's some type of load. It needs to adapt. Okay, so mechanical tension. Then metabolic stress. Okay, so metabolic stress, there's metabolites within the muscles that then can lead to more growth. Okay, then after metabolic stress, we're looking at uh, potentially some type of muscular damage. Muscular damage occurs, satellite cells are proliferated, the satellite cells proliferate, and they heal the specific area, and then they, they in turn become stronger. So that's the third. The fourth aspect would be some type of neurological improvements, okay, mainly around speed of recruitment, um, type or, or, or magnitude of recruitment, how many motor units, how much muscle is in, in turn being recruited at a given time. But if we're looking at what bodybuilding exercises do, it's typically going to live in metabolic stress. And it's typically going to live in, uh, um, in the realm of uh, muscle damage as well because of the crazy large amount of reps. Now, if we look at why should you be using them? Okay, so you're an athlete. Why do athletes need bodybuilding exercises? Aren't they just going to make me big and slow? Aren't they just going to break down? I'm going to sneak in my, my marathon, little marathon medal right here. Aren't bodybuilding exercises going to make me big and bulky? Aren't they just going to increase my muscle size and then I'm going to be too, too slow to, to play soccer? And we have to look at it and say the downfall here is now we're looking at it. If we look at bodybuilding exercises in that light, we're saying that all bodybuilders train this specific way instead of saying, okay, these are exercises that bodybuilders use. Let's use them at a fraction of the volume that bodybuilders use them at. We can still reap some benefits from those bodybuilding exercises, right? And then because we reap some benefits, we have to look at it and say, okay, well, if we have, let's just say soccer players, they're more prone to knee issues, all right? So if they're more prone to knee issues, can we use specific bodybuilding movements? Let's say they have hamstring instability, right? Hamstring instability. All right, well, let's do some leg curls. Let's do some standing leg curls. Let's do some... Um, Let's do some leg extensions possibly to, to help with the co-contraction around that. Or maybe their quads are, are struggling to, to recruit or they have a quad strain. Maybe there's a quad strain and it hurts when they do things at high speed, but it doesn't hurt when they do leg extensions or when they do sled pulls backwards. So we can develop more muscle mass leading into the area at a slower speed. And because now there's more blood flow, there's going to be more metabolites present, and that's going to lead to more muscular growth. That Then when we heal from that potential quad injury, now we can train at higher speeds, and then in turn, we lead to better performance. So if we, if we see why we should be using them, now all of a sudden, it's like, okay, I'm a shot putter. I have... Uh, a tricep issue. I have, or I have an elbow issue. Well, why don't I train uh, my triceps and biceps a little bit more? See if I can alleviate that stress. I can bring in some metabolites to the area. I want to do tricep extensions and incline hammer curls for three sets of thirty on each, you know, each exercise for four or five weeks. See if that gets rid of any of my uh, tendinopathy that I have, and see if that improves over time. So now. That's why we can be using those uh, those movements. And it also, especially in women, becomes this cheat code for developing more muscle mass, especially through their shoulders and through their through their extension and their elbows. And now that creates them to be more stable because we can increase their, their muscle mass at a, in a quicker clip. 
So that's some of the reasons why. How can someone program these hypertrophy exercises in those training days? And the way I look at it is that if we're looking at sports performance related stuff, then general related training, then bodybuilding, I think that's the easiest way to, to teach someone how to program. Okay, so if we're programming in a week, we are essentially looking at one to two days of very sports performance related training. Okay, then we're going to look at maybe one day of general training, one day of hypertrophy training. Okay, right there is an easy template that you can use. If you look at Lulu, we're going leg day, upper body day, leg day, upper body day. Typically, the first two leg and upper body days are going to be very sports specific. The second two are going to be more uh, hypertrophic general. And that even comes down into how you would lay out an actual program for a given day. So if we're looking at a day, oh, Coach Dane, you know, don't call me Coach Dane, just say Dane. Dane, we want to lay out a day. How do I program these hypertrophy exercises on specific training days? Well, first of all, we can put them easily into the accessory portion. So if we're going sports specific, right, so we're doing some type of heavier explosive movement in 1a then in 2a and 2b we're doing some more general strength based work so that's where like you put a back squat but then we want to do all right well now we have knee issues a hamstring injury and lower back pain all right we've got three accessories let's do reverse hyper let's do single leg leg curl and let's do you know a calf issue let's do calf raises those are three like really really popular bodybuilding exercises so that's how you would lay out on that given day. And then you look at it and you say, okay, there's accessories on day one, but then we could even devote an entire day, hypertrophy day, to increasing size and mass depending upon the time of year. If you start to look at, all right, we're further out from, from a season and I have football players, I want them to get bigger. I want them to, be, to have more muscle mass. Even with my swimmers that I train, I've got multiple swimmers, especially recently actually, who just uh, meddled at, uh, Michigan States for swimming. Uh, I've got one swimmer right now in the D3 ranks. She was a Michigan State champion. I believe that she could end up becoming an NCAA champion this year, possibly. The main goal is getting her to have more muscle mass, and oftentimes it is done through uh, that type of that type of bodybuilding style of training. And so that takes us into just reacting. I want to react to this first video, which is going to be. Um, our own video on bodybuilding for athletes. And so if we look at this bodybuilding for athletes, I think the, the big thing that we want to dive into is understanding why, understanding how, understanding what you guys can take away from this, and then how we can then discuss this a little bit further. We got three videos that we're going to go over. First one's, of course, from Garage Strength when I was super swole wearing a Narwhal t-shirt. Then we're going to get into uh, overtime athletes and their take on muscle mass for athletes. And then we're going to go check out some of the stuff from Mind Pump uh, when athletes build too much muscle. And then we're going to take all of your guys' questions. So we're going to get into that first one right here. Uh, this is our reaction to Garage Strength's uh bodybuilding and bodybuilding for athletes five tips to improve athletic performance jason are you gonna load this one i don't know if jason wants me to just press play here we go I'm pre Structural integrity, structural bodybuilding. That's the way we've got to start to think through this. Structural integrity. Trying to pause this. There we go. All right, so that's the first one. Now the second one, let's check this one out. This is going to be from Overtime Athletes. Stress to the athlete without burning them out. 
The other factor is, is that we don't want to sacrifice the athlete's speed, agility, quickness, and power, all the things that are going to make them the athlete on the field that they are. So there's a delicate balance there when it comes to actually programming the athlete. If it was just to you know, blow up an individual, obviously there's many ways to skin a cat. You know, if you look at bodybuilding, they perform a, a great deal of single joint, isolated movements where they're really focused on the hypertrophy stimulus. But we have to consider all these modalities when it comes to the athlete. This is also goes without saying that you have your, your nutrition in check, you're in a caloric surplus, your sleep, your recovery dialed in. I think that's a good one there is where we've got to understand and realize that when we're actually um, thinking through training, right? And that's why I brought up how an easy way to program it for a specific day is going to say, okay, we've got athlete performance here, right? So athlete athlete performance is going to be focusing on impulse. It's going to be focusing on, you know, let blast impulse, sustained impulse, those, those big factors that are going to make you very, very twitchy. Then if we're looking at the next strength characteristic, okay, now we're looking at absolute strength. Absolute strength is going to be supporting that impulse factor. And then the third, the third aspect could be hypertrophy. And it, I think the interesting part is recognizing that hypertrophy will occur so if we have somebody that's like i want to get bigger you can still get really really big doing performance enhancing exercises so doing cleans doing back squats doing front squats doing incline benches doing pull-ups and at the same time as long as we're precise with recovery and as long as we're precise with how we're actually training some of the accessories we can still get you really really big but it is still going to come down to you know, mastering the details, uh, which is another big factor of just making sure you're sleeping well and making sure that you're in a caloric surplus if we're trying to get more muscle mass, if that's one of the main goals. Now, I want to go into our final reaction to a video here. Check out Mind Pump and what they say about um, when an athlete might gain too much mass. Work out to improve mobility and function and control and strength and stamina. What typically follows that is a balanced symmetrical, strong looking physique. The other isn't always true. There's a lot of people that train hard for aesthetics and they sacrifice movement because in the pursuit of aesthetics and then because they continue to sacrifice movement, they start to get injuries, they move poorly and they slowly start to lose their aesthetics. You can get hyper-focused on certain areas of your body and you know really bring them up. But uh, once we keep like focusing on segmenting the body and uh, not considering the whole, it's gonna affect the how everything performs together harmoniously. And so that's that's something that you always gotta consider that in terms of like when we're in a certain phase too long, especially in just focusing on aesthetics, it's uh, how how can I now apply uh, this these muscles that I've acquired and how, how are they functioning as opposed to just how big and um, you know, veiny and, and vascular they are. Yeah, you know what's funny is that when I was younger, I remember, obviously, my goal was I wanted to get big. Right? I think one thing one thing I wanted to point out there is, like, if we're looking at even somebody like Ronnie Coleman, right, back in the day, I, I think that just being aware that he, as a bodybuilder, one, bodybuilders need to have really, really good mobility. So if we're in this mindset of, like, we want to get bigger, right, we want to get really, really large, we still have to be focusing on mobility. We still have to be thinking about lengthening muscle, right? The longer a muscle gets, the more mechanical tension we can put on that, that specific area. And the more you know, range of motion that we train, in theory, more metabolites there will be, which will in turn help us grow more. And so I think that, oh, wow, sissy squats is the best bodybuilding exercise for athletes. Dude, I did not expect that. I know there's only 38 votes, which I feel like we always have 38 votes. But sissy squats winning there is impressive. I think that oftentimes when we're when we're looking at bodybuilding movements, I think the the big negative for for using bodybuilding exercises is one, there people will say, you're gonna get big and bulky. Even though we're ignoring the fact that bodybuilders are some of the most mobile individuals on the planet because they do a lot of controlled pauses, right? They're doing a lot of stretching. They're doing a lot of recovery work, okay? 
The other big factor is some bodybuilders, you look at uh, using the Ronnie Coleman example, he was a mutant, right? He looked like an absolute mutant. But this is using bodybuilding exercises and using them as little, maybe 15% of your program is different than saying, let's train like a bodybuilder 100% of the time. If we're going to train like a bodybuilder 100% of the time, our outcome is going to be totally different. Now, if we take tidbits from that, it's just like a power lifter. If we train it, if we want to train like a power lifter 100% of the time, then we might as well just be power lifters. But people make these blanket statements. Power lifting sucks. I do that all the time. I make that statement quite a bit. Yes, I understand this. But there's still tidbits from powerlifting that I need to use. There's still lessons. There's still theories. There's still strategy that I can use from powerlifting at specific times of the year to develop the athlete. The ultimate thing has to come back to, and this is something that I, you know, you can look at. I've deadlifted 705 pounds. I've run a marathon. If I wanted to deadlift 705 pounds again, the first thing that I would do is try to design 20 to 40 weeks of training like a power lifter. That's my sole goal. That's what I'm going full steam ahead on. Then my nutrition, my recovery, I'm going to gain weight. Everything is going to be in line to achieve that goal. If I want to go run a marathon again, which I want to, if I want to go do these things and run a faster marathon and be able to to, to sustain um, the, the beating from running, which is funny, more running, I need to make sure I'm actually doing my bodybuilding exercises so I'm staying healthy. My, my main goal has to be to design a program to be able to run the marathon. So it goes back to using tidbits from these different specific training methodologies, right? And then formulating that program around what your specific goal is. And then looking at it through that timeline, how much time do we have? I think that's one of the big factors that, um, OTA mentioned from overtime athletes. He had mentioned like there's only a certain time frame, so there's a constraint of time, and there's really a constraint of time every time we have an athlete come into the gym, and so you have to prioritize based off of what their goal is. And I think that's just a big factor. So that even when I say things sometimes to parents, like, well, you know, we're gonna do some bodybuilding exercises on little Johnny because he's not that big and for football. Well, you're not gonna train him like a bodybuilder, are you? Hold on a second, dude. Shut your mouth. I'm almost 40 and I got gray hair and I'm bald. I can tell you how we're going to train your kid. And it comes back to understanding the full global vision for the athlete and where each strategy, each tidbit comes into play. And I think that's one of those big factors. And before we continue this Q&A, if you guys are interested in deeper dive discussions like this around training, all you guys have to do uh, is sign up for our channel membership. Consider becoming a channel member. We meet every single Friday where I give you direct tips on improving your training. And it's a really positive group of people that are super motivated to become great athletes and coaches. Last week, I think we posted our video was all on how can humans get faster? How can humans run faster? This is in a private group. So you can get in there. There's going to be minimal amounts of other individuals. It's 10 bucks a month uh, for a full one hour lecture every single week. That's less than a price. That's less than a the cost of a cup of coffee. You got to click join the join button. If you're on desktop or click the link in the description, if you want to become a channel member today, that's if you are on YouTube. And if you don't want to spend that 10 bucks, you can also check out the garage strength podcast on YouTube or any other podcast app. Just check the link in the description, check out that garage strength podcast. So I wanted to point that out. And now we're going to get into some of the other questions that you guys are having here and what you want to know about that training. You know, I did sort of wish, I wish we would have had some paper, so one other research paper. I think we should actually do a vote. Should we, oh, B. Wallace, thanks for becoming the newest member. B. Wallace, thank you. Um, should we in the future break down research papers on our public live or no? One research paper on public live or it's too too long, too arduous, don't do it. I think that would be a cool little add-on because there is some bodybuilding papers that, that are out there about just e even muscle mass and, and muscle mass related to, to power output. So let's get into Dane. How do you progress on lifts week to week within a phase in terms of load or volume? Basically, it depends on the lever, the level. This is from Big Z. So this is going to be, you know, if I have somebody like Haley Reichert or, you know, let's say a world-class athlete, we might progress lifts and do two weeks here at high volume, two weeks here at, at 
high intensity, then go back to high volume, then go back to high intensity. We also might do this interesting thing that I've been playing around with right now is we might do like using somebody, let's say somebody's on a bench press, right? We're trying to increase the bench press. If we do, and we're talking about world-class athletes. So I'll use Sam Mattis bench press. His best bench press is 530. He's a discus thrower for Sam. We might do, okay, let's go uh, flat bench. Okay. Week one and two. Let's go uh, week three and four, 30 degree incline. Then let's go back to flat bench week five and six. Then let's go back to 30 degree incline seven and eight. Okay. So that's like some ways that, you, that we like to press progress with, with the world-class level athletes. You guys got to go vote on that research uh, topic, by the way, go vote in the, um, in the poll right there, power clean semen period and those options. Yes. Now, if we're looking at, um, if we're looking at s somebody who is more mid-level of an athlete, right? Let's say that we have a high school kid and we're trying to progress week over week. I think one area that a lot of people get lost in is that every single week, if we have a high school kid, so we've got a kid like right now. Okay. Actually this kid, Peter Jones, look him up. Okay. Peter Jones, he's in, um, Malvern PA. I've been working with him a little bit with one of my close friends. Uh, he's, he's committed to Notre Dame. He's a guard, absolute savage, just inclined 315 today for four this morning. Someone like Peter could do the same exact lift with the same exact rep scheme for four to five weeks. And there doesn't need to be a progression because he's just constantly getting freaking stronger because he's 17 and he's an absolute hoss. So I think that that's where we've got to be looking at what type of athlete are we talking about? What type of adaptation are we trying to get and what level are they at? And the other big factor that we have to bring in is that if we're using advanced techniques or advanced strategies, so if we're talking about Sam Mattis and we're doing the, the really interesting uh, undulation of intensity and volume or the really interesting uh, progressions of lift to lift to lift where we're going you know, flat bench to low incline to flat bench to low incline, we have to realize that every time that we make, that we deploy this strategy, this type of strategy, his body is making a defense mechanism and that same strategy might not work in the future. So we've got to be aware of that when our athletes are younger to not give them too many different types of stimuli that could lead to adaptations or to, that could lead to defense mechanisms that could then prevent them from getting better later on. Okay. I know that's a lot, but that's like how I like to think about things. So it's like, when, when we're younger, that's, I think that we can be a little bit more, I guess, a little bit easier with those, with those methods. And I even think about it as, as far as, you know, looking at my son, Lincoln, right? If I look at Lincoln and, you know, we were just in Colorado and it's like, Lincoln, I just want you to do three power cleans, three front squats, uh, drop it and then do two full cleans. And we can do that for 35 minutes and he's going to get stronger. He's literally going to get stronger doing that. So that's where it's like, keep it simple, especially with the younger kids. Keith just came in. How young should athletes start to implement bodybuilding into their training? I think this is where I think that when athletes, so athletes that we get on site, they will do some type of bodybuilding movement the first day that they're training. And I think the interesting part, I've talked about this in some videos, is that when you see a, an athlete here, right, like sort of benching like this, and they're like super, super wobbly, they're either super unathletic, okay, which is pretty normal, or they just don't have the neuromuscular coordination yet, the, the stimulus has not been imposed on them to lift, to learn how to recruit, and to learn how to be more coordinated. And so the first like eight to 10 weeks that an athlete is actually resistance training, they haven't even really gained muscle mass yet. They're literally just, in, they're improving their coordination skill. So now they're learning how to coordinate the muscles that they have at a higher speed. And when that happens, they get stronger. This is, there's a lot of research behind that. So we're going to do bodybuilding stuff. There's, there's evidence from Brad Schoenfeld's group of, of researchers that you can have athletes doing like sets of 12 to 15 plus reps and they're still going to get stronger all the way down to like 40 to 45% of maximum and they're still going to get stronger. So if we know that, then we should be using bodybuilding tactics pretty freaking early uh, in their in their ability. The other, the other thing is, is like they don't take that much time. So 
if I have somebody who's in season, when I have athletes in season, they're really going to do one impulse focused lift. And then they're probably going to do one or two bodybuilding style of lifts. Okay. Cause they don't take that much time. You take less rest. You can, t- it's, it's a typically a isolated joint movement. And then the next day we might do a strength lift with hypertrophy. And so you can sort of go back and forth. Uh, let me know if that helps. Let's see. Keith, you, did you, you didn't like that one, Keith, that answer? What are the main muscles other than legs that helps in weighted squats and how to strengthen those muscles? I mean, if we're going to be looking, this is from Aaron. If we're going to be looking at what are the main muscles other than legs that help in weighted squats? I mean, are you considering the glutes part of the legs, the hamstrings part of the legs, the quads part of the legs? Like I mean, that, those are going to be the main things behind increasing um <laughs> Keith, you're so ridiculous. Uh, hang on, I'm going to respond to that. Um, now, if we look at, and this is almost like a, maybe this could be like a future, a future segment here is like absurdities of the week. I've had two absurd questions. One is, will bodybuilding hinder growth? And the second one is, is creatine bad for you? Like literally, somebody has been hounding me. Like, I heard creatine is bad for you. I heard creatine is like one of the worst things out there right now that you shouldn't be using it. Anyway, going back to Aaron's uh, question here, when I'm looking at somebody like myself, okay, I've got a very, very strong posterior chain. As I mentioned, maybe I should just keep mentioning it so I feel good about myself because I'm not that strong right now. I deadlifted 705 pounds. Did I tell you that? Oh, and I ran a marathon. Hashtag runner. Now, (laughs) um, if we're looking at strengthening somebody like myself in their posterior chain or um, throughout their body without looking at their leg muscles. I'm trying, this is a hard one to break down four squats. We would be looking at their trunks. So we would be looking at abs, upper back, lower back. And that's where for Aaron's question, uh, you could use something like uh, good mornings for the lower back. You're still going to target some of the hamstrings, but you're still going to also strengthen the lower back. You're going to look at abs. You're going to be looking at reverse hypers. Uh, You're going to look at carries potentially to help improve that posture in the back so that's that's what i would would say along those lines can olympic lifting be introduced before bodybuilding i have a seven-year-old i think what i would recommend is i would do weightlifting movements first um and then i I would after i would do weightlifting exercises first okay i would then do a lot of bodybuilding movements one area that i think i've made a mistake with my son lincoln who's 12 is that i think that we could have done more bodybuilding work with him when he was younger. Mainly from a mental perspective, dude, it's freaking hard to train like a bodybuilder. It's hard to do. Yesterday, I did three sets of 25 on the incline dumbbell bench. And I was doing it with the hundreds, did it with the 90s. And it's like, dude, the last like eight to 10 reps, you feel like a baby, a total baby. But that's like the mental uh, stress that these bodybuilders put themselves through. It's, it's very impressive. And I think that you can benefit from it quite a bit. Um, Isaiah saying we need to see a collab with Renaissance periodization. That would be really, really cool. I would love that. That would be fun. Uh, that would be very fun. React to the research papers. So you guys commented on future live streams. You had 18 votes. 77% of you said that we should be breaking down a paper. And maybe, you know, with 77% of you saying we break down a paper, we've just got to focus on keeping that more concise. How would you plan speed, lifting, and position work in a week? I want to answer this, but Keith, you know, Samuel, I'm going to come back to you. Keith had posted this question. And again, I, I had said this earlier. The two most ridiculous questions currently, does lifting stunt growth, is creatine bad for you? First of all, is creatine bad for you? Don't take it from me. Take it from Dr. Scott Forbes, Dr. Darren Kandel, Dr. Richard Kreider, all these people who have spent their entire uh what was it, Doctor? Is it Jose uh, Ant- Antonio? He's down in. I think he's down in at Nova. Um, all of these researchers have spent tons of time looking at what does creatine do. It's a me- It's an amino acid. It does not cause negative issues with your body. That doesn't happen. Now, does lifting stunt growth? Is there any evidence that lifting stunts growth? Zero. Second, people will say, well, it can, it can cause a stress fracture in your growth, in your growth plate. First of all, so then we would break down, do stress fractures, fractures in your growth plate hinder uh, growth? Yes, potentially they can, potentially they can. Does stress fractures does in, in the sport of resistance based training. So strength training, 
is there a very high rate of stress fractures of your growth plates? No, not at all. It's not at all. And in fact, I want to say it was a British uh, medical journal broke this down and resistance-based training has like one of the lowest rates of uh, growth plate fissures out of all sports on the planet. I think like, you know, American football is number one. Uh, Baseball was really high. Like all of these other sports that everybody else plays. But for some reason, people still say that resistance-based training can hinder growth and it is not accurate. It does not happen. Um, So yes, just going over that. That's something too. We've, we've talked about here that maybe we should make another video. We've got one or two videos on that, but they, we made them a while ago. So we sort of talked about potentially doing that again in the, in the future. Um, now going back to the, the discussion around, uh, Samuel's question, how would you plan speed lifting and position work in a week? And so I think that, uh, Samuel, what I would ask is, I'm assuming this is specific to a sport like football. Okay. So if I was doing, if I was doing a speed, um, speed work, right. And then position work, I would probably do that on the same day. I would resistance based train three to four days a week, probably four days a week minimum. Um, but I would, I would say four days is the safe bet. And I would go, uh, a leg day, a upper body day, an impulse slash athlete day. And on that impulse athlete day, I would try to bring in more speed stuff. And then the, the fourth day would be hypertrophy day. Okay. So if the fourth day is hypertrophy day, then what I would do is work back and say, all right, if we're in the off season, can you get two days of position work? You know, maybe you spend 45 to 60 minutes working on your stance, working on pulling, working on the, the, um, the first step uh, as alignment or, or anything, or maybe you, you work on your routes, you do slow routes, you try to run better routes, you try to learn the drills of a combine, maybe things along those lines, right? So you, you really go through the technical aspect. Then speed-based work, I would say I would start with twice a week. And so I would do some type of speed work before my leg lift, and I would do some type of speed work before my athlete day or my impulse day on, which would be the the that would be the third lifting day. That's a real easy way. And then maybe one of the, one of those easier days, you know, maybe the fifth day when you're not lifting, you could do more like sled work, something along those, those lines, like sled sprints, something like that, or hill sprints. And that would be essentially, uh, three key things that you could, three ways that you could focus on speed, um, speed based work, lifting and position work. Um, now how much this is from, Augustine, Augustine, Augustine. Hello. How much should I have body fat ratio in 147 pounds as a Olympic weightlifter? I'm about to have my first competition soon. I used to have at least 8.8% when I competed in boxing. So if I'm 147, what is that? 67 K you're a 67 K lifter. You should probably, probably be around 10% to 12% maximum. 10% would probably be good. Um, I hope that helps there. Uh, how to get bear hug type strength. I think how to get bear hug type strength. The first place I would start would be zombie squats. The second place I would do, I would lift stones quite a bit. I would do a lot of cleans and I'll shit load of rope climbs, shit load of rope climbs and pull-ups, rope, climb, pull up, rope, climb, pull up, rope, climb, pull up along with stones. That's a great way to improve your bear hug. Uh, for Dr. Mike, let Mike put Dane through hell and then talk about bodybuilding for athletic performance on the podcast. I would have to, I would actually do a review of a, I would actually have to, I would want to get in some type of shape if I was going to do a like a lift because I would probably throw up. Um, can a person with borderline high uric acid consume protein powder? Aaron, you've got to consult your doctor on that one. When should I begin taking protein powder? Consult your doctor on that one. But I would, I would say like my son at times, he's 12 years old. He can take protein powder and it's safe. Uh, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he does. Explain the impact of muscle mass on athleticism. Again, so this goes back to the beginning. Um, I think it's important that we increase muscle mass because muscle mass can indeed lead to a higher power output uh, in certain situations. And if we create uh, our programming very effectively, we can develop a massive amount of muscle mass. And then if we're training it very well, we can in turn uh, 
teach that muscle how to recruit very, very effectively. I also think if you have problem areas, uh, if you have, if you play a sport that is more prone to a specific type of injury, it does pay, uh, to use bodybuilding or increasing muscle mass in specific joint areas to increase stability through that, that point. Um, I think that would be, some of the best ways and then again also it does help with uh improving recovery bodybuilding exercises definitely and increasing muscle mass can can help in that aspect this is kind of a niche question from joey hodge do you think extensor training muscles in the forearm is possible is a possible method for forearm hypertrophy i don't i'm thinking about like pruning or terrace and extensors here I think you're going to get a, a little bit of, of forearm mass. I'm trying to flex my forearm because they're so, yeah, I would think more so. I think the forearm mass is probably going to be coming from the brachioradialis and a little bit of pronator terrace here. Um, that's a tough question. I, I almost, I, I don't know if I can answer that and I'm trying to flex through, you know, how much hypertrophy is going to, is that going to need or how much attention is that going to need for you to get hypertrophy? I'm looking at, I'm thinking about two, like uh, one bodybuilders, but two also arm wrestlers have quite a bit of hypertrophy in their forearms, but it's typically not in the extensors. So it's like, I, I don't know. I, I'd have to look into that a little bit more. What's an ideal linebacker in high school? What is an ideal linebacker in high school? Uh, and I, I don't know. An ideal linebacker in high school would have been, Ray Lewis was probably an ideal linebacker in high school. Gonzo, are you asking me? Um, are you asking me questions around what lifts is best for a linebacker? Uh, just let me know. Shins and calves, cramping basketball, exercises to develop leg and vertical jump, uh, high hang power snatches, front squats, back squats. Extremely effective at developing leg strength and vertical jump. And then what I would do um, when I would you know, trying to clean that stuff up for your cramping. I don't know. Have you tried salts or potassium or magnesium? That also tends to be another thing. How to develop freak shoulder power for bouldering. This is this is something where I would do explosive Donkey Kongs. We've got videos of athletes doing Donkey Kongs. We've got uh, explosive rope climb, med ball slams, and also sled pulls with a rope. Um, how do I increase my grip strength? I think you got to look at grip is going to be isometric. Okay. Is one way to increase your grip strength. Explosive grip strength is also pivotal. So think about rope climbing, think about flipping uh, plates and then also rotation of your forearm. Okay. That's another way. So that's where we can train the brachialis. Uh, but also if we're like rotating a sledgehammer or something like that, that's some of the best ways that you can improve that. Someone asked me on Instagram. So I am live on Instagram right now. Somebody asked if we have a ratio for overweight to underweight, uh, shots. And I want to just answer that quick. Typically what I would recommend for that is about 60% of your throws overweight, 40% underweight. If you're throwing those two different implements, let me know if that helps. Did you, do you think that climbers should focus more in athletic day on upper body? Probably. But I also think you got to remember too, that you've got to have really, really freaking athletic, uh, athletic feet and legs as a climber. Uh, you got to be explosive. So I, I think a little bit of both. I think impulse day definitely more so athletic ability, athletic ability or impulse would be focused on upper body. Best exercises for professional furniture movers, pro furniture movers. If I was a professional furniture mover, I would do trap bar deadlifts. I would do deadlifts. I would do cleans. I would do zombie squats, zombie squat, zombie squat, zombie squat. And I would do zombie squat and possibly, possibly I'm going to eat these words from everybody. Zercher squats. I would do Zercher squats and I would probably do Zercher single leg squats. I would probably do zombie or Zercher uh, step ups. I would do stuff like that. That's like going up and down steps in crazy positions. And actually somebody had just uh, DM me on Instagram asking if we would ever do a variation, single leg variation, single leg squat vari variations. That could be another survey in the future. Uh, next time, maybe how are the new YouTube channels going? The new YouTube channel. So peak strength has been doing well. We're almost, I think we've been around for a year now. Uh, peak strength's going well, garage strength, weightlifting, solid garage strength podcast, at which was growing a little bit quicker, but we're going to try to pay a little bit more attention to it in the future. I appreciate that information of speed, positional and strength training throughout the week. 
What else would you suggest to keep in mind for someone who has a full-time job in the U.S. Navy? Thank you in the U.S. Navy, Eli. Now, what I would do, you're working three to midnight. So to me, you've got the perfect schedule to wake up at a decent time. Let's say nine o'clock, you, you get ready, you go out and you're running sprints in the morning, sled sprints or hill sprints. And then maybe, or maybe instead you do, you know, 10 by 20 meter sprints working on your start, the first 20 meters, and then you can do some type of upper body stuff. You're doing power cleans into single leg squats and then some some Nordics, right? Like that's a great workout right there. And I, I think that one of the things to bring up here, and, and then, dude, we're doing some really freaking crazy stuff on the back end of peak strength right now, but inside peak strength, like if you guys go to peak strength and you click on like you're a football player or, or you're a lacrosse player, if you're a football player, you can click on, I'm a football player. I'm a skilled position. I want to train like a quarterback. And you get a program built around that specific goal. And this goes back to the beginning. If we're trying to train as athletes, we have to look at what the goal is long term. And that's how we lay out all those programs inside Peak Strength. Uh, and so, again, all of that stuff is, is it all plays massive roles and how you have to think about long-term development. And also part of long-term development is you got to test. You got to have a vision. You got to be thinking about where do you want to be. Um, you know, and then that just continuously develops. No, the new YouTube panel, Jay. Oh, Keith, are you talking about my personal one? I haven't, yeah, I have not, I have not posted anything on there. How can I hypertrophy my tendons? I want thick ligaments. This is from Russell Bowman. So Russell... My high school strength coach used to talk about uh, when when the best way to train um, the best way to train any type of ligament, right? So he would actually do. We would actually do this. We do like sets of fifty to fifty five reps with the back squat. Like let's just say with like ninety five pounds on, and we'd have kids in class throwing up like all the time. But we would do this this bone ligament training, and it was always super, super high reps. And I think, again, this goes back to, to the bodybuilding style of training. Is that's where you can see a massive improvement and increase in tendons, ligaments, specifically because you're going to be under tension for such long periods of time. So, Russell, for you, with the lower back, with that hip, um, super high maybe you just need one of those abductor adductor machines super high reps uh in that regard but also uh more more unilateral high rep work like so i'm I'm even thinking we used to do lunges for like five minutes but one thing i think maybe you could try is like yo what if i did you know two sets of 45 single leg squats to warm up and see what would happen see if that just lights up the glute a little bit more and you you pull a little bit more effectively you catch it doesn't bug you that could be uh, something unique. Hi, Dane. I'm a basketball player from Argentina. How would you periodize or split workouts throughout the week? And I'm assuming, uh, Joaquin, that you are also mentioning that you're playing in season. I, and this is something we talk about in some of the podcasts. I would recommend you just lift twice a week in season. Okay, one upper body day, one lower body, or one upper body day, one lower body day. And I would also, out of season, probably go one lower, one upper, one athlete day. And that, that should help you with that. Um, let me know if that helps. Asthma impacting performance on the court and solutions or fixes. That's where you've got to you've got to go talk to your doctor about that one. Gonzo came in. Ideal high school linebacker. What weight? What attributes? And what lifts? And that's a great question there, Gonzo. Is that I think if we're looking at linebackers at the next level, uh, snatches versus cleans for hurlers, I would honestly I'd probably go snatches higher speed. I think if we're looking at a high school linebacker, 215 to 230, somewhere in that realm is going to be perfect. Uh, I think you also have to recognize very good lateral movement capability, so strong glutes, um, good pre-snap reads. you got to be able to have good pre-snap reads. You have to have good feeling with your opponents, so if they're trying to push you one way, you know how to manipulate them. So that's where, like, pause, dumbbell benches, two-box cleans, High hang power snatches, single leg squats are going to play a major role. That's going to help you be lateral. That's going to help you apply force in that unilateral position. Alternating dumbbell benches like this, that's another great one. And we just got to use those lifts over constant 
time frames. And again, Gonzo, we use this for linebackers inside peak strength um, to really help develop that. But also just the speed, the ability to close gaps very quickly is also going to play a major role. Is the standard gym teacher skill coach workout with push-ups, bodyweight squats, lunges, sit-ups good for youth athletes or are they already at some point those exercises are kind of pointless? Okay, so this would be, I think it depends on the kid. I think kids could do that workout for probably three months and it would be fantastic. I think there is a point where some kids, it might not be, but most kids, it'd be great. Um, should you train even if you have the flu? It depends. How bad do you feel? Probably not. Give yourself a couple days off and see if you feel better. Also, do you have any tips for covering from the flu? First tip, talk to your doctor. Second tip, bone broth, uh, apple cider vinegar, vinegar kombucha, um, bone marrow. Uh, I, I love all those. High, high, high. You know, I, I'd probably recommend vitamin D. Um, that's, that's where I would roll with that. Let me know if that helps Uncle Fester. Quinn, on speed days, would you focus more on sprints or plyometrics for football? If I had a speed day on an athlete day, we'd go plyometrics and then speed. If I have another traditional all speed day, then we're just going no plyos. We're going all speed. We're going to focus. Now, the other thing is, is that some speed work, some drills, some some technical aspects is still going to be plyometric based. So just keep that in mind. Best pressing movements for boulderers. Uh, kneeling dumbbell press or kneeling uh, kettlebell press, I think. Will you do a video on how to implement strength and athletic training into public schools for gym teachers to use? Dude, that's a good one. I don't know how well that would do, but I think that's something that we could provide a really unique um, perspective on. And I think where we're fortunate in the United States is that most high schools, I'm even thinking about high schools in our general area around here, uh, even more of the high schools that are not as wealthy, okay? Even those high schools still have access to a weight room. And I think the cool part is is that there's so much that you can do in resistance training that doesn't require a lot of weights that we can get real creative. So I think that would be a really cool uh, idea. I don't know how well that would perform, Keith, but it's a good idea. I like it. Uh, Zercher squats, really? Dane finally recommended Zercher squats. I know I sort of feel dirty doing that. Do you think that the slow twitch, fast twitch ratio gets semi-permanently set based on how a youth exercises? Okay, so that's a really, really good question. I don't think it gets set. I think, think about this way, okay? So Dr. B used to explain this to me where it would be, if we are looking at setting fast twitch and slow twitch, I believe when you look at like farm strength, you have a a kid who grows up in the farm or he grows up in the city and they're, they're at the playground all day, right? You have active kids doing jumps. You have active kids carrying things, carrying bricks or water or or feed bags, whatever, right? They're just, they're running They're Maybe they're chasing, you know, I'm even thinking about being on a farm, chasing pigs or something, right? Birds, chickens, whatever that athlete or that individual grows up. And before they're hitting puberty, their body thinks that they need to create the physical attributes for this individual to survive based off of all of the feedback that that person is doing on a daily basis. All the physical things that you have a youth athlete do or youth individual do before they hit puberty, their body's setting in motion like the long term structure that it's going that it is going to predict to fuel a successful survival. So if where let's say we have an athlete swimming, right? They're doing long distance swimming, but then they're doing plyometrics and they're jumping. They're playing basketball. Um, and they're also doing speed stuff and they're also bodybuilding. The individual, their body will grow up with absurd stability. That's one thing I think that, that needs to be acknowledged with farmers is like, Farm strength around here, like, you know, we're in the middle of farm fields. Literally behind you is a massive farm field. And it's like behind the camera. Sorry, by the way. Um, These kids grow up with stability because they're doing physical things all the time. And they tend to be really strong. They tend to be really explosive because their co-contractions, these skills of co-contractions have been imprinted over a long period of time. So to answer that question, I don't necessarily think that 
the fiber ratio of fast twitch to slow twitch, I don't really foresee that having a negative impact. I don't think there's enough volume at a young age to for it to have a negative impact. I think in most cases, kids are going to be doing more explosive-based exercises, and that's where they're going to see great development anyway. But still having a kid swim or um, you know ride a bike or whatever, is, it's still going to have a positive impact on their aerobic capacity as well. Dane, you said you wake up at 0900. I, I usually, like this morning, I was up at 5 to go for a run. Um, at 09, do I do my sprints fasted? You you can do your sprints fasted if you want to. You don't have to. Dane, king of uh, no man's land. is I, Was Max making fun of me for no man's land? Uh, my other son is 8 and a wrestler. What are good workouts for him? Pull-ups, handstand push-ups, clap push-ups, dips. Um, I know farmers that are not strong whatsoever. Really? I mean, maybe this could be a downfall of commercial farming. Maybe they're just using machines all the time. Um, okay, so let's 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 see. implement strength, athletic training. Okay, what lifts should I do to include? Okay, as a football wide receiver, as a football wide receiver, this is a tough one. You're talking about somebody who's taller. I would say front squats to a box. Single leg squats are phenomenal. A lot of overhead stability work, uh, walking lunges. Um, dumbbell bench presses dumbbell military presses and a lot of trunk work as along with uh let's say some plyometric work where they're doing box jumps hurdle hops stair jumps anything along those lines one more question from magic i'm a soccer player so i need to build my muscles so what do i have to do about that single leg squat single leg bounce um Let's even look at something like Cossack squats, goblet squats, walking lunges, Nordics. All of those movements are going to help improve the strength of a soccer player throughout their entire body, which is going to lead to greater performance. What is this poll that we are running right now? Let me see what that is. That poll is. I can't read it. Oh, wait. Whoops. Oh, shoot. I just ended the poll. Sorry, Jason. I ruined this poll. Should we do a video on... Oh, my gosh. It's, uh, yes. 80% said yes out of 10 votes. And I think I just ended the poll early. I did not mean to do that. Um, anyway. I'm a rugby player. And in my upper body day, I do vertical and horizontal push and pull. What accessory exercises would you implement after them? Um, let's do Let's do for a rugby player... Uh, let's do some shoulder work. So like dumbbell external rotations, seated dumbbell external rotations. Don't use 15s. Try to actually use some weight on them. Uh, some meadow swings. I would hit some high rep meadow swings. And then I would probably finish that off with some type of trunk work. So uh, walrus or body, body saw, something along those lines. Thanks for tuning in this week to this week's live. I'm going to talk to you guys next week. Head over to peakstrength.app, pick up the app today so you guys can get swole. Peace.